opinion, right? <laughs> it is a sad state of affairs when a president has to decide who goes to the bathroom. <laughs> Something just ain't right about that. Somebody has too much of their nose in our business. Sorry, Tommy. That's the way I think about it. It's just politics, and it's bad politics. That's right. Amen. Well, you got Trump, so. <laughs> we do have Trump. That's true. That's true. I can't wait. I'm going to tell you, I can't wait. <laughs> Neither can I, really, if you want to want the truth in it. Okay, <clears throat> enough of that. Foolishness, and that's what it is. It's foolishness. If you stand, please. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read verses 23 through 29. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edit. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be treated mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. And by faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Father, we just thank you for this day that we've come here today, Father, to praise you for the almighty God that you are, and Father, to study your scriptures and to look at this great man of long ago history. And, Father, we thank you for the lessons that we have here today. And, Father, we just thank you for our time, your time, your faith, your care, your grace, your mercy, and ask, Father, that you would bless us during our time here this morning. And, Father, continue to bless us in all that we do. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you need a, you know, if you need a title this morning, like it says in the bulletin, there's four keys to effective living. Now, <clears throat> I can hear it kind of rattling around out there this morning. At our age, why do we need instructions on how to live our life? Well, I don't know about you, but I plan to live 30 or more years, so more years, and, you know, it's good to have some instructions on how to, to finish out my life. Had I, at the age of some of these kiddos right here, these young people here, have been told these four steps to effective living, I don't know if I, when I was their age if I'd have paid any attention to it or not. But I do know that at my age, I have learned that what I'm going to talk about this morning and what Moses demonstrated to us are things that we all need to know at any point in our life, and we need to apply those things. If everybody would apply what we're going to talk about here this morning to their life, we wouldn't have a bathroom issue all over our country this month, okay? Now, we read out of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 of Hebrews is all about winners. You read that chapter, it's God's hall of fame for, the, for faith. And it talks about ordinary people, ordinary people who accomplish some extraordinary things in their life. Now, they weren't perfect, and they often failed, but they reach their goal. And that's the purpose that we all need to be need to have in our life is to establish a goal and reach that goal. So as we look at these verses of scripture this morning, I think as, a, as an individual, we can be encouraged. And as a church, we can be encouraged by looking at what Moses did. Now this morning, he's talking about, in, in these verses of scripture, he's talking about Moses. And we all know that Moses was the greatest man in the Old Testament. We know that he was a good guy. God had enough faith in him that he gave him the Ten Commandments directly to Moses. 
Moses wrote the first five books in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and he led the children of Israel out of slavery and captivity in Egypt. Now, why was God able to use Moses so effectively? Well, I think it was because Moses settled four basic questions in his life. In verse 24, he settled the problem of who am I? And what are my choices in verse 25? What is really important in verse 26? And what are my goals in verse 27? Now, he deals with the, the questions in these verses, as they're telling us here. And we're going to look at them this morning. And we're going to, to try to apply these to the title of the lesson this morning. The Four Keys to Effective Living. Now, the first key to effective living is really simple. It's really easy. You have to be yourself. You don't try to be somebody else. God made you for a purpose. God made you for a plan that he has. And nobody else can be you except you. Moses had to deal with this particular idea right off in his life because he had an identity crisis. <clears throat> in Egypt, all the Jewish boys were condemned to die. His parents and his mother put him in a little boat or a little basket and set him adrift on the Nile River. And it just so happens downstream from where they put, put him in there, Pharaoh's daughter and her entourage were taking a bath. They saw the basket. Pharaoh's daughter took the little uh, baby, took him into the palace to raise him as her own. Now, Moses had this identity crisis. He was born Jewish but he was raised Egyptian. And he had to decide some point in his life, who am I? And it was a really, uh, a real important decision that he had to make because it was going to affect the rest of his life. Because if he said, I'm an Egyptian, and if he, he said that and he faked his heritage, then he'd live a life of ease. You know, he'd have an outstanding career. He was in line to be Pharaoh. And he would have had fame and he had had fortune. And if he said that I'm Jewish, then he would have been kicked out of the palace. All of this royal stuff that he had would be taken away from him. And he'd be sent to live with a bunch of slaves. Yet Moses saw all of his people being badly mistreated as slaves. And being a man of character and integrity, he couldn't be silent. He couldn't quiet nor still his conscience. So he made a decision that cost him the next 80 years of his life. Now in verse 24, would you look at underline that word refused in there? <clears throat> the word in the Greek literally means to reject, to deny, to totally disown. And Moses cut him off, cut himself off from a promising career as an Egyptian. And he refused to live a lie. Instead, he wanted to do what God wanted him to do. Now, you know, there's something good, a good feeling that you have when you know that you're being yourself. You know, the quickest way that I know of to have an altar is try to be somebody that you're not. You know, you have to live an effective life. And the first step of that then is to relax and to be yourself. And in verse 25, you've circled or underlined the word choosing in that verse. And that literally means to decide or to select. So the first principle of effective living is that we have to choose to be yourself. And the second then is to be responsible. We need to accept responsibility for our own life. You know, we don't blame somebody else for what we are, what we do, you know. You have to decide how you're going to be, how you're going, what you're going to do, and you're going to accept responsibility for that. And if there are negatives in your life, then you do something about it. You decide to change your life. You know, in fact, I have choices that I can make in my life, and, and so do you. I have options on those choices. God has given me and you the freedom to choose. Now, what I choose today 
is going to determine my tomorrow. Amen. And, you know, that's what you call accepting responsibility. The Bible teaches that people who accept responsibility <coughs> for their own lives, they tend to lead effective lives. 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 That's a life. Lives. And in verse 23, or in verse 24, we see Moses refusing, and in verse 25, we see Moses choosing. And there's a principle here. And then the underlying in these verses is the fact that negative is always followed by positive. And you think about that. You know, God never says, don't do this or don't do that. You know, he doesn't say, don't drink, smoke, cuss, or go out with girls that do. He doesn't say, don't do anything. He says, whatever you take something out of your life, you replace it with something positive. Amen? <clears throat> you see you see the refusing, then you see the choosing, because Christianity is not a negative religion of a bunch of don'ts. God tells us how to live our life, but he does not say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. You know, as a baby, now God chose Moses. And when Moses grew up, in verse 25, it says that he chose God. Now, God has chosen each one of us this morning. He's chosen you, but have we chosen him? You know, some of the young people here, we need to make a choice this morning. And we can't have it both ways. There's only two choices that are sitting up on the shelf for our life, and that's pleasing ourselves or pleasing God. Now, look at 24 again. When did Moses make this choice? It says when he was come to some years. Well, one of the marks of maturity is when you and I accept responsibilities for our own decisions. You just can't blame other people. You have to assume responsibility for your own decision. You know, in society, a lot of times, society is, is really willing and allowed to allow us to pass the buck. You know, they provide a lot of ways for us to not accept responsibility for what we do and who we are. I say, well, it's not your fault. You can blame your environment. You can blame the fact they wouldn't let you use the restroom of your choice when you were a child. When you're a baby, your mother held your head under the water in the bathtub too long, and you've got all these repressed emotions, and it's no wonder that you're raping and pillaging and that you're a really bad person. It's really not your fault. You know, the world's got a lot of excuses. Got a lot of excuses. And you can't blame somebody else for the direction that your life has taken. You can't live off somebody else's spiritual commitment. You have to make your own decision. You have to make your own spiritual commitment to God. You say, well, you know, my parents were Christian. Or my wife's a Christian. I think that's great. That's terrific. But you have to make a personal commitment on your own one thing we need to remember is the fact that God has no grandchildren he has only children so Moses when he grew up he made a choice he accepted responsibility for his life the fact of the matter is that nobody can ultimately ruin your life or ruin my life except you and me Satan can't because he doesn't have the power and God won't because he loves you. So ultimately, the only person who can totally and permanently mess up our lives are us. Amen? Right. So if you want to be effective in life, you have to be yourself. You have to accept responsibility. And like Moses, you have to make some choices. No matter what's happened in the past, you have the freedom to choose how you're going to respond. To your past, to your present, to your future. You just say, am I going to be bitter or am I going to be better? And your happiness is determined by the character in your life. And your character is determined by the choices that you make. So be yourself, be responsible, accept responsibility for your own condition. And then you have to have some values. The third thing that Moses had. Each one of us has to establish a value system. You have to settle this one issue in your life. 
what is really important. <clears throat> and it's not something that you decide haphazardly either. You have to give it some serious thought. You give it consideration. You pray about it. You ask, what's really important to me? And that's the thing that Moses did. He clarified his values. He thought it out. Now, in the King James Version, if you're using the King James Version, in verse 26, it says, esteeming. And in my ESV, it says, considered. But either way, the word literally means to weigh in the balance, consider the options, consider the value of this decision. And this says that Moses considered God's will to be of greater value than all of the treasures of Egypt. So what are your values for life? You know, what are my values? What are the things on which we base our life right now? Well, you can say, well, think about that. You pray about it and you say, well, these are the things that are important to me on which I base my decisions. Again, why am I spending time on this? Well, we all know that if you don't determine what's valuable in your life, that somebody else will just will do it for you, right? If you don't decide how you're going to use your time, other people are going to tell you how to use your time. And if you don't decide how you're going to spend your money, other people are going to decide that for you. You have to determine your values in life by, determine, by determining what is important. So what are the values in life? You know, what, do, what are the world's standards? Well, there's three common values that I think that the world sees and the world is promoting today. And all, of the, all three of these kind of, if, if you look at everything that's going on, you can see these things and what's happening. The world is search, frantically searching for these three things and they're mentioned in these verses. The world says, I want to feel good. The world's looking for pleasure, looking for possessions. I want to have a lot. And the world says, I want to have power. And I want to be famous. I want to be in influential. I want to be popular. I want to have power, prestige, and position. And most of the world is frantically searching for these three things today. That's their value system. Is that the value system that we want? You know, by the world standards, if you look at these three things, when you look at Moses, you know, Moses had it made. Everything that people in the world today are looking for, he already had it. He already had power and pleasure and possessions. <coughs> and all three of those were wrapped up in the royalty of Egypt. Yet he walked away from all of that to go live with a bunch of slaves. Well, now who'd be silly enough to do that? Somebody with a different value system would do that. He realized that some things are more important than others. And he realized that some things are more important than possessions and more th things are more important than pleasures. He wasn't satisfied with things that would not last. He wanted something a lot more important. Now, Psalms 84 verse 10 pretty much sums it up. It says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. There's a lesson here in Moses' life. And we have to focus on that lesson. It's when we establish a value system for our life, we have to learn to say no. Sometimes you just have to to say no to things that, that you're asked of. You have to choose something in your life. And when you do that, you're automatically turning against something else, right? If you choose this, you've not chosen that. Now, you don't have the time or the money for everything. And by saying actually saying yes in a more resounding way is when you say no. You say no. I'm not going to do that. And you're actually saying yes to something else in a, more, in a more resounding way, a more forceful way. So when you do that, then you can do a few things well instead of a lot of things badly. You know, some people say yes to every task that they're asked of. 
I say yes to every task in the church. And they need to learn to say no. But some people will take that statement right there and they'll turn it around to justify why they say no to a lot of things that the church needs. You know, we're talking about saying no to opportunities to serve, but we're not talking about saying no to the commands that we are given to obey. You know, here at New Hope Church, we need to be able to say no to things that are optional, but not to the things that we're commanded to do as a church. You know, we've all discovered that it's very easy to say yes to God. And it's a lot more difficult to say no to everything else. But when we say no to all of this other stuff, then we're creating the space in our life for God. Amen? God says, he comes to you and God says, I want to offer you abundant life. <coughs> I come that you might have life. I want to offer you a purpose in life, peace of mind, power for daily living, help for your problems, eternal life, forgiveness. And we all say, you bet, that's what I want. I don't know anybody that would say no to all of that, right? But what we don't realize is that when you say yes to God, you're automatically saying no to a lot of other things in life. It's, a, it's automatic. It's not really a yes until the no takes effect. That makes sense? You understand that? <coughs> the person who tries to say yes to two things at the same time is what the Bible calls a double-minded man. James chapter 1 verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. It's important. I want you to notice the value system of Moses. Moses decided three things, and they're important because we remember him today because he made these decisions. You know, if he had not made these decisions, we wouldn't even be talking about Moses today. You know, he'd be, he'd be a mummy in some Egyptian king's tomb right now. We'd be saying, Moses, who? Who was Moses? I don't remember reading about Moses. But because he made these decisions, we know all about his life. We know all the value systems of <coughs> Moses' life. Moses decided three things. One, that God's purpose is more valuable than popularity. Now, do you think the title, the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, think that was a status symbol? Yeah, you bet it was. He was second in command. He was big man on campus. I guess he was big man at the pyramids, right? He probably had his picture on the Jer Jerusalem Gazette at least once a week. He was an up-and-coming yuppie. He was well-known. He had status. People probably bowed before Moses. He had the kind of opportunity that most people today would give their right, said, they'd say, well, I'd give my right arm to be treated like that. I'd love to be treated like royalty. But Moses knew that popularity wouldn't last. And, and the thing I, I like about Moses is the fact that he was not impressed with himself. Moses wanted God's purpose for his life, and he said, I'd rather be a slave fulfilling God's purpose for my life than I had to be a king in Egypt with all the popularity. If I had that, I wouldn't be in God's purpose. I wouldn't be following God's plan. And he said, God's purpose is more valuable than popularity. And then he said that God's people are more valuable than pleasures. At this point in the life, all these people were slaves in Egypt, and they were building the pyramids. Now, you think about all of that would entail. And given that particular situation, <clears throat> how would you have reacted? You know, Moses chose pain over pleasure. He chose discomfort over ease. Why did he do that? Because people are more valuable than pleasures. He was on Easy Street. He was treated royalty. Like royalty, it was a lifestyle of luxury. If he wanted his grapes peeled, they peeled his grapes. If he wanted them warm or cold, they were warmed or co cooled for him. Whatever he had in mind, they were there ready to, be to, to do that for him.
But Moses heard the cry of the people. And he said that people are more important than pleasures. And in order to do the right thing, he chose discomfort <coughs> over comfort. Because he knew that pleasure, like popularity, doesn't last but for a insignificant period of time. <coughs> now, the Bible tells us that there's pleasure in sin for a season. Now, that season, that word season there is for a, means for a short time. Now, <clears throat> bear with me here. Sin is fun. If sin was a bummer, nobody would do it. Right? Would you sin if it were painful? Of course not. You're smarter than that. <clears throat> I mean, the Bible says that there is pleasure in sin for a season. What that's saying is you can get your kicks, but at some point in time you're going to get the kick back. Right? There's pleasure in sin, no doubt about it. But when you reap what you sow, the payoff is not worth the pleasure. It's just not worth it. Now, Moses said he'd go with the people of God because people are more important than pleasures, and that God's purpose is more important than popularity. But in verse 26, it gives us another characteristic of Moses. It says he had humility. He's rejecting the world's measure in verse 24, the world's pleasure in 25, and the world's treasure in 26. The very thing that people spend their lives trying to get, he has rejected the treasure in Egypt because he had a third value. And that third value was God's peace is more valuable than possession. There are some things in our life that are more important than other things. And, you know, there's a great peace of mind that comes about, a great satisfaction we have, a sense of fulfillment when we know that we are smack dab in the middle of God's will. And we all know we can't buy God's will. You can't purchase something like that. You can't buy a peace of mind. But the commercial says it's priceless. It's not something that you can buy. You cannot purchase lasting happiness. You know, we think the Constitution says life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. <laughs> but it doesn't. It says the pursuit of happiness. We have the God-given right to seek and to pursue happiness. Everybody agree with that? Yes. All right. Well, let me admit something to you. Contrary to what I've said in the past, you can buy happiness. You can buy it for a short period of time. Illustration of that. Let's say I buy a ski boat. Then I go out here and, you know, me and a couple of my buddies, we're out here on the lake, we're skiing, we're having a great time, we're happy, right? Then I realize that we try to take the wives out there and that my boat's not big enough to pull my buddies and their wives. I need a new boat. So I go buy a bigger boat. Take it out there. Am I happy? You bet. I got everybody skiing. We're great. Then about three or four months later, they come out with a new ski boat with <laughs> new gadgets on it. Better than mine. Got to have it. So I go buy that boat. Am I happy? Yeah, for a short period of time. That's what some of the old timers used to call keeping up with the Joneses. That's when we, you know what that is, right? That's when we buy things with money we don't have to please people we don't even like. Right? <laughs> so you can buy happiness, but it's a temporary kind of happiness. You know, it doesn't last. It's like the things you bought last Christmas, you know, those things you said, well, I just got to have this. <clears throat> well, here it is four or five months later. Where is that thing you just had to have at Christmas time? Got to have this gadget. And you enjoy it for about three weeks, then it winds up on the shelf with all of those other gadgets that you purchased in the past that no longer make you happy. And that's what Moses said. Moses said, I don't want pleasure. I don't want possessions. They just won't last. Moses was taking the long look. He wasn't looking at this right now. He was looking way on down the road. <coughs> the problem is that so many of us have so much to live on and so little to live for. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things 
that he possesses. Yet we spend our whole life acting like that's not true. <clears throat> Would, am I saying that you should sell everything you own and go live in poverty? No, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. Because wealth in itself is neutral. Wealth is neither good or bad. That's how you use it. You know, a lot of the, the, the biblical Christians, the saints in the Bible, were extremely wealthy people. They were probably millionaires. And in, in today's money, they may have been billionaires but they were wealthy people. But it's all a matter of values. You know, we should love people and use things, but what happens to us is we get that reversed. That's when we get in trouble. If when we start lo loving things and using people to get things. Things are to be used, they're not to be loved, and that's the value system that Moses said, God's peace is more valuable than possessions. Now, it's amazing that Moses gave up the three things that most people spend their entire lives trying to accomplish and achieve. Now, why did he do that? Why did he reject power and, and pleasure and possessions? Well, look at verse 26, the latter part of verse 26. It says he did all of that for the reward. He was looking ahead. He was living in the light of eternity. That's why he made these decisions. I hope you catch this statement right here. It says, your happiness is determined by your character. Your character is determined by your choices. And your choices are determined by your values. And your values are determined by your vision. So what's in your eye this morning? Moses had his values right because he had his vision right. And that brings us to that fourth key ingredient that we see in Moses. Is that Moses had some vision. We should never take our eye off the goal. We should have that vision. That vision to keep the main thing, the main thing. Always before us. Moses continually visualized his goal. He was insistent. And he focused his attention on this one goal. And he constantly kept that before him. You know, some of us used to have a vision. We started out right. But now we seem like we've forgotten our vision. But look in verse 27. It says, by faith. Vision is a matter of faith. Seeing is a matter of faith. Moses was seeing with the eyes of faith. Left Egypt. He persevered because he saw who? Who did he see? The man that's invisible. Who, he who is invisible, and that's God. He saw God. Moses never took his eyes off the goat. You know, why would I want to do that if, if I wanted to have an effective life? Well, that's because we never progress without some problems. If we have good vision, we stay focused. We know we're going to have problems. And sometimes we just can't see straight. That's why we need that vision. Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. Obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Amen? Now, there were a lot of problems in the pursuit of the purpose that God had given Moses for his life. You know, how are you going to transport two million Jews out of one country, across the most desolate piece of land in the world, without any food, without water, and get them into the promised land. How are you going to convince Pharaoh, who had two million slaves, to give up that much property? <coughs> there was an enormous problem in the pursuit of the goal that God had given Moses. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But he persevered because he focused on his goal and not the problem. More than anything else that Moses had to learn was he had to learn to wait. There were a lot of delays in Moses seeing the fulfillment of his goal. When Moses was a young man, God gave him a goal. He said, you're going to be the deliverer, deliverer of an entire nation. But it was 80 years in coming 
before Moses was able to make or take his people right up to the edge of the promised land. Now, how would you like to wait 80 years 